Hello, everyone, and welcome to the other 23 hours, uh, a presentation from Jane Myers and Equiculture. And thanks very much to Jane, who's tuning in from a slightly less sunny uh, UK at uh, to, uh, tonight, today. Uh, I would say this morning in her, in her part of the world. So thank yeah. you, Jane, for joining us. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners. Uh, for me, I, I'm on Jajarang country, uh, the Macedon Rangers Shire Council, who are the hosts of this evening, are also on uh, Jajarang country, Tangarang and Wurundjeri countries. And I want to acknowledge that uh, the land that we're all meeting on. So I wish to pay my respects to to the people uh, that are joining us from other countries and also those that are going to join the recording at some later stage. Pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I particularly want to uh, pay my respects to any Torres Strait or Aboriginal uh, Islander people that uh, are joining us tonight. So I'll just uh, quickly now hand over to Viviana from Melbourne Water, who is uh, a key uh, partner in this uh, event this evening. Thanks, Jason and Jane. Um, I've um, been um, lucky enough to hear Jane Myers talk quite a few times now. I think the first time I heard Jane uh, present what was at a Melbourne Water Forum at um, the, the Melbourne Airport, and that would well and truly have to be over ten years ago. Um, I'm a former um, a former environment officer at Mitchell Shire Council, and we were lucky enough to have Jane um, present to um, a couple of our workshops and, and land care groups. So, yeah, um, I'll also be uh, talking to you at the end of the. Um, webinar uh, just to uh, link you with some further resources available to, to assist you. So yeah, I'll hand it over to Jane. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jason and Viviana. So we'll get going. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, here we go. And all right, I'll just get started. I'm sure from beginning. There we go. Right. So just very briefly, for those of you that might not have come across agriculture before, we did live in Australia for 25 years. So in case you're wondering how come you know we're qualified to talk about Australian conditions, we did actually live there for a long time, mainly on the East Coast. So we've lived in Victoria, in Canberra, and in Queensland. So we, we um, and during that time, we developed our system of management that we now teach all over the world. Um, so we've sort of adapted it to other countries, but it did start in Australia, in case you're wondering. Okay, so tonight's talk um, is called The Other 23 Hours, but basically it's looking at the lifestyle of horses. And we need to understand that if we're going to manage them well, because we need to understand what they need to do. And basically that tends to work out at the other 23 hours of the day, the, the, you know, apart from the hour or two that we might be interacting with them. It's very important that the rest of the time they get to live as natural a lifestyle as possible. And it just so happens that that also means that if you get that right, then it actually makes managing the land much better easier and better there's massive um positive repercussions if you actually acknowledge how they're meant to live um because as you'll see throughout this talk if horses are managed well they're actually really good for the land if they're managed badly they're not good for the land so they have that reputation but horses are actually really good for the land and that's something we've learned more about since coming back to the uk where they are indigenous um and they're now being used for recreating biodiversity. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. So, um, right, I'm just gonna move this box out of the way because it's in my way. Right, so in the last 40 or 50 years in the Western world, 
the role of domestic horses has changed from a work animal um, to mainly a leisure animal. I know in Australia there's still lots of uh, cases where horses do actually work for a living, but the vast majority of horses by far are leisure animals. So horses now rarely work for a living. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but but it certainly has created lots of uh, issues for horses because they now, for instance, rarely um, burn off enough energy um, with the way they're kept in terms of how much they're getting in, taking in through feed, plus added to the fact that we're, we are being marketed to all the time to buy more high energy feed for horses that rarely actually need that level of feed. So we need to keep that in mind all the time that really our horse probably doesn't need, you know, even half as much feed as they're getting sometimes. So it's a, it is a huge issue. Um, and this change in their lifestyle has actually come about very rapidly in evolutionary terms. So it's really, as I said, just the last 40 or 50 years, and there's not been a lot of research done about that because... Um, it's happened quite quickly. So they've gone from working very hard to most of the time not working at all. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. And so the development of horse keeping practices has progressed in a very ad hoc but human focused fashion since domestication centuries ago. And again, this is not surprising at all because when we first started keeping horses for our benefit, you know, terms like welfare and land management, all these issues, all these terms weren't, weren't even thought of. So, you know, obviously we, as humans, we did what we thought was best for us at the time. Um, their welfare didn't even come into it because that wasn't even a concept particularly back then as it is now. Um, <clears throat> so it's not surprising that the way we keep horses has developed down one line, but as always happens with um, ingrained traditions and so on and cultures, it's very hard to change something further down the track. And so things are changing, um, and for some people quite rapidly, but for other people, they're still not willing to look at a different way of keeping horses because that's, as far as they're concerned, that's the way it's always been done, when in fact it hasn't really. It's been done like that for a few hundred years or even a couple of thousand years in some cultures, but it's not really that long in terms of the evolution of the horse. It's, you know, it's only a tiny amount of time. Um, so it really is time to start looking differently at, at how we keep horses because the traditional way of keeping horses usually doesn't suit them at all and it's not good for the environment either, it turns out. So there's lots of downsides to keeping them in that way. Um, so as, as I said, it's not surprising because they were in the past, they were a resource or a tool. So basically in the past, they were the car, train, bus or whatever of today. And we tended to think of them that way. And back then as well, they were a leisure activity for the work, were very wealthy. But other than that, they were a work animal. So the, the little, very little thoughts being put into how this affects the way modern horses are managed. Um, and as I said, their workload has re reduced dramatically. But also at the same time, they're now being kept in increasingly smaller, smaller areas. So even in Australia, where horses generally get to live outside a lot of the time, the opposite is true in the city areas, for instance. I mean, I was just amazed some of the when I visited places like Sydney, where horses are kept inside 24-7, just like they are in parts of Europe. Um, you know, they literally are kept inside all of the time. Uh, police horses, work, so working horses as well, that sort of thing, but kept inside all the time. And it's, you know, it's sort of accepted, but the ideas are starting to change. But here in the UK, they're actually building places now still that where the horses live inside 24-7 never actually get turned out. So it's, it's pretty bad, really. But increasing awareness of issues such as equine health and welfare combined with a growing concern for the environment has led to questions being asked about how and why we keep equines the way we do. So I've always said that if, if animal rights activists actually knew a bit more about horse behaviour and horse physiology, anatomy and so on, they would actually have a field day with the horse industry because the problem with horses is they can actually look really good. They look shiny and they look happy to the untrained eye, they look like they're doing fine when in fact, they're not doing well at all. Um, you know, they're at risk of colic from stress and so on, horses that are kept inside too much. 
So we do need to start changing the way we keep horses, definitely. We need to start looking at how we keep them and looking at how we can do it differently. So although the dream is to spend many hours interacting with our horses, be it riding, training, or just hanging out with them, the unfortunate reality is that for most of us, life, life gets in the way. And I really think that these days we have even less time to actually spend doing things with our horses than we used to do, because I think there's a lot more pressure, certainly with kids, for instance, who used to, if they had a horse, that was probably their main leisure activity. Kids now have 101 different things to do with their time, and this leads to issues with ponies getting too fat and so on, because they, those kids, as well as having all these other activities to do, a lot more pressure is also put on them to do well at school and so a lot more homework and that type of thing. So these ponies, which when I was a kid, you know, I literally rode every single day. I never had an issue with weight on my horse. It was actually getting weight on my pony that was an issue because I used to ride so much. It's now the opposite situation because kids just do not have that sort of freedom and time that we had um, when we were younger, generally speaking. They just don't have that sort of time. So that's one of the things that's adding to this epidemic of laminitis and all the issues that go with that is that we just do not have time to, to put enough um, exercise into our horses or ponies. So what can we do to enrich the lifestyle of our horses when we're not with them? What can we do about the other 23 hours? How can we ensure that this time benefits them both physically and mentally? So looking at um, equiculture, our, um, our ethos, just very briefly, is that with horse ownership comes a lot of responsibility. We have a responsibility to manage our horses to the best of our ability and to do this sustainably and ethically. So it's just something to keep in mind all the time, if we can, is how well can we do it, which takes their needs into account and also is sustainable. Because if something's not sustainable, you can't maintain it. That's something to think about. If, you, if it's not sustainable, then it, you might be able to do it for a little while, but you're not going to be able to keep it up. So by not sustainable, I mean, even in terms of for instance, what something costs. So if something's too expensive to do, you can only do it so long before you run out of money. Or if you're running, you know, the way you're managing your horses is ruining the land, eventually you'll have to buy in more bought-in feed. So that's not sustainable and so on. So we need to be looking at our, our area of land that we keep our horses on, whether we rent or own that land, in as, and look at how we can manage that as sustainably as possible. Because... Otherwise, at some point, something is going to run out and, and, and then it's just going to get harder. And it's, for some people, that means that they'll have to actually give up their horses or, um, or work that hard to, to pay for their horses that they no longer get to spend as much time as they want with the horses. And that starts a downward spiral of events. So we need to look at everything we do as how can we make this more sustainable um, and yeah, and it's a good way to think of things. Can we keep it up? So first of all, we need to um, understand why horses are, I'm just sorry, I'm just going to try and get rid of this bar at the top. I can't. Um, why horses um, behave the way they do? What, what, the, the thing, you know, why they spend time doing the, the different things that they do? So horses, basically, first of all, what is a horse? So a horse is a monogastric, that's a single stomach herbivore. And the reason it's important to understand this is because a lot of the information that's out there about keeping horses is as if horses are actually just like cows. And the only similarities that cows and horses have really is they're both grazing animals, they're both a similar size. Um, but really, that's about where the similarities end, because... They're very different. So a horse has a single stomach, just like we do and just like a dog does, where a, a cow is a ruminant animal and digests their food differently. So they have a different strategy to getting what they need from what they eat. But the way that horses are actually has many benefits when it comes to managing them. And I'll go into those a little bit more later on. So, yeah, so horses graze and digest their food differently. So they, as I said, they have one stomach, they graze and digest at the same time. So whereas cows eat really fast and then go off and lay down and, and spend time digesting that food, 
horses trickle feed. So all the time they're grazing in their hind gut, they're also digesting that food. So they, the, um, they, their food is actually, at the end of the day, they're less processed than that of a cow. They're not quite as efficient as a cow. They need more food, but they can actually survive on lower quality food than a cow can. So cows actually need better quality food, believe it or not. Horses can survive on food that cows would actually starve on. So, for instance, here in the UK, where ponies live wild down on Dartmoor and Exmoor, in the winter, the cows are all brought in um, and brought into big sheds and fed on hay through the winter, but the wild ponies, or the sort of semi-feral ponies, just stay out there all winter, digging for bits of grass, eating gorse off gorse bushes, because the native down there, and survive. And a cow would literally starve to death that in that respect you know if they had to live like that so and the reason it's important to understand that is because we are often led to believe that horses need high quality food and yes they need you know they need good clean food but in terms of energy they need very low energy food if we're going to keep them um you know in a way that they're meant to live and um, so not you know not the same level as what cows need the upshot of horses not being quite as good at digesting the food is that their manure has more nutrients in it. And that is actually why gardeners always used to prefer horse manure um, is because it used to have more nutrients in it. Because So what you put in one end, more of it comes out the other end than it does with a cow. And that's also worth keeping in mind. If you're putting a lot in, a lot of it actually gets wasted because the horse can only actually use so much of it. And a lot comes out the other end and just ha happens to make good, um, good manure. So they evolved to eat low energy plants over a large range. So horses are basically a fiber processing animal and naturally they seek out fiber over nutrition. And this is a really important point is that horses are always looking for fiber. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why if your, your trees start to get ring barked by the horses, it's generally because they're not getting enough fiber. They're not getting enough hay or grass. But even if they're eating just grass, it can sometimes be not high enough in fiber. So for instance, if you're turning them out on green, fresh grass, that grass can be 80 or 90% water. And at that point, the horses will actually start to ring back bark trees often because the fat, the grass is not fibrous enough. So when you do, a, a, yeah, a little tip is when you do turn horses out on that, say, spring grass, besides the other issues with that, you've got to be careful anyway with horses. It's always a good idea to, to bring them in part of each day or, or do it out in the paddock, actually give them hay. They need that dry feed that that fibrous feed um which fresh grass doesn't give them so that's when they'll start to ring back the trees so horses are always looking for fiber and i'll come back to this point later on because it's really important in and horses naturally live in what's called a home range so many large grazing herbivores so if you think to, to africa where you've got large large groups of herb, herbivorous animals a lot of the other herbivores migrate. So they might move from one side of the, the, the landscape to the other, and they'll spend half the year doing that, and then half the year coming back again. So you, you've all seen these big migrations of, say, wildebeest and so on. And um, you know, bison and so on, those types of animals tend to do the same thing. Horses are different in that they don't do that. And this is actually a plus point when it comes to keeping horses in the domestic situation. Horses live in what's called a home range. That means that's an area that contains all the resources that they need on a daily or sometimes two or three day basis. So like in Australia, even though they're not meant to live in Australia, horses do very well in that climate. So where they live as feral horses, they actually their home range can be absolutely huge because it has to be for them to actually be able to access all of the resources that they need so they, they have to travel a long way to water and a long way to feed and so on. But they're still always moving around that same home range. They're not migrating across the landscape. That means that when we keep horses in the domestic situation, 
it's actually far easier to copy that, which I'll go into later on, than it is for an animal that would naturally migrate across the landscape. So that's a really, really important point. Horses don't care at all how large that home range is. They would be, they're quite happy if it is just a few paddocks big, as long as it contains everything they need in terms of water, shelter and food, they're quite happy if the food comes past them on a conveyor belt and they don't have to move at all. All they're bothered about is that the food is there and that they can access it. So obviously we don't want them doing that. We want them to move. But um, that's, all, that's what they want to happen is just the food come to them. But it doesn't come to them. They have to go to it if you're grazing them in the paddocks. So <clears throat> as I said, it's actually very easy to set this situation up when you know how to do it, which I'll be talking about a little bit. So as I said, the size varies due to the availability. So here in the UK where ponies do live wild, down in the south of England, their home ranges might be just a few hundred or less square hundred miles, in fact, often a lot less. In Australia and in America where Mustangs live, their home range might be several thousand square miles, but they, they still just move around that same area on a constant basis. And as I said, we can use this instinctive behavior to our and their advantage. But we must, also, we must always remember when we keep horses that they're a herd animal. So everybody knows this. Even people who know nothing about horses in general will say, oh, yes, horses are herd animals, aren't they? They know that. And yet we often ignore that fact about their behavior because it suits us as humans to do that. Horses need other horses for security and companionship. So much so now that in Europe, I think it's Switzerland has now passed a law. It's either Switzerland or Sweden. They've passed a law that a horse must be in sight of another horse at all times. It cannot live out of sight of other horses, which is quite incredible. I, th I think that can actually just be, say, a neighbouring horse. So at least, you know, the horse doesn't have to, have to be in the same paddock, but it has to be able to see another horse. So that's really interesting that they've actually gone as far as doing that because it is so important for them. And when we separate horses, that's when a lot of the uh, behavioural issues start with them. So that's when they start doing things like crib biting, weaving, uh, box walking, all these different things. Or in a paddock situation, horses will start walking the fence line. That You see that a lot with stallions that are traditionally, but don't have to be, but they are, kept on their own. So, the, so all they do is walk the fence line backwards and forwards trying to get to other horses. So that's one example of where you can see that causes land management issues, um, behavioural issues and so on. And again, that can all be turned around if we change the way we manage them. So just by the way, all domestic horses are actually part of a very small family now. Um, and a lot of the t uh, types of equine actually died out even before humans. So it's not entirely down to humans as to why the equine family is tiny compared to other classes of animals. So basically, we've got uh, domestic horses, obviously, which are in no way, shape or form at risk of um, becoming extinct. But we've got zebra, Chevalsky horses, wild asses and domestic donkeys. Um, and that's it, pretty much. Um, so it's a very small family, even though one member of that family, Equus caballus, which is domestic horses, is huge. But that's just because of, hu of humans' intervention. Otherwise, they would probably be just as scarce as the others. And very interestingly, the nearest cousins to um, equines are rhinoceros and tapir, which people are often quite surprised about. So horses are in no way related to cattle, not at all. In fact, they're probably more related to us, to pigs, to dogs, and so on than they are to cattle. It goes even further back before they're related to ruminant animal, animals. So they're very different. Um, so yes, rhinoceros and tapir are their nearest relatives. After that is elephants. And as I said later on, further on, it's pigs and so on that they're closely, more closely related to. So just very briefly, the horse's stomach digestive system, I'm not going to go into this too much because you can find this information quite easily anywhere, but 
The horse's digestive system pretty much looks like ours does on the inside. Um, certain parts of it are in different proportions. So the cecum, that bit in the middle, is the same as our appendix. We can live without it. It's very small and we can manage without it. It's not ideal, but we can. If you, took, if you were to take out that organ in a horse, you would literally starve to death because he needs that massive cecum to help him digest the fibre that he eats, the horse. The stomach is relatively smaller than ours. So it's, 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 you know, physically it's not smaller than ours. But what I mean is if you take into account the size of the animal, the stomach is very small. And that's because food doesn't spend very long there before it moves on to the next stage in their digestive system. But the really important thing to keep in mind about a horse's stomach that's different to ours and a dog's is that with horses... Food acid is being con constantly dripped into the stomach. It's on a constant basis. It's only a tiny amount, but it's constant. And that's because in the, in the wild situation, a horse always has access to food if he needs it. That might be as low quality as leaves and twigs, but he's always got access to that. So therefore, in evolutionary terms, it's quite safe for that acid to be constantly dripped into the stomach because there's always something in the stomach that can buffer that acid. Whereas with humans and dogs, that acid is only released into the stomach as we start to eat. And that's because with humans and dogs, we would have naturally gone long periods without food and then made a kill or whatever and eaten. And that's when the, um, and that's when the acid was released to help us to digest that food. So the really important point about that is that with horses, if we feed them like we feed ourselves, where we feed them on meals, which is what tends to happen with stabled horses, that acid is building up in the stomach when they don't necessarily have access to food because people tend to be to restrict the food when they keep them in that situation. And this is one of the reasons why we see gastric ulcers in domestic horses so frequently. And it really is a huge problem, especially in stabled horses because people tend to not give them enough fiber. And so the acid is building up in their stomach. Um, so as I've already said about the cecum, um, which is the same as our appendix, and that houses billions and billions of bacteria, which help the horse to digest their food. In fact, when you feed your horse, you're not actually feeding your horse, you're feeding the bacteria, and that in turn feeds your horse. Without that bacteria, your horse wouldn't last any time at all. It totally, 100% relies on that bacteria. So it's a really good example of a symbiotic relationship. It needs that bacteria 100%. I mean, we rely on it a lot as well, uh, but horses is 100%. Without it, they just simply cannot survive. So we need to understand a little bit about that in order to feed our horses um, and keep them healthy because without the bacteria, they just simply die. So there's many advantages for being a free living versus a domestic horse. Basically, what I'm meaning is there's advantages and disadvantages. I'm just going to really quickly look at some of those. So a free living horses eat a very high fiber, low energy, low protein diet and graze for very long periods each day. And I'll go into how long those periods are later on. They always live in herds and are on the alert much of the time. So and they actually share that alert behavior between the adult herd members so that individual is not exhausted because obviously they have to take it in turns to sleep and so on um, and, and have tight, yeah. So sometimes they're sleeping, but other times they take it in turns to be alert. They travel many kilometers a day from where the feed is and the water is and back again in what's known as the um, home range, as I've already mentioned about the home range. So they're always moving, but they're up, but just around the home range area. They cope with a variety of climates ranging from very cold to very hot. And horses actually, and this is one of the reasons why they can live as a feral animal in almost any climate in the world, is that they actually can cope with a huge range of climates. The one that they really do not do well with is high humidity. So around Northern Australia is the one that they really don't cope well with. So that hot, humid weather. And the reason that they don't is because horses like just the same as humans, and I think they're the only animals, us and them, that do this, 
rely on sweating to keep cool, whereas most other animals have different methods of cooling down. And sweating doesn't work in high humidity because as you as you sweat and the, and the moisture is on the outside of the body, it relies on a cooler, drier air passing past the body to cool you down. So if you sweat in high humidity, um, you don't cool down, basically. And this is and horses, besides, besides having that the same as us, they're much larger than we are, generally speaking. The larger a body is, the longer it takes to warm up, but the longer it takes to cool down. So when a horse is in very hot, humid weather, once they get warm, they're actually even more uncomfortable than we are. And that's why some horses just simply cannot cope with the climate in Darwin and so on. And certainly racehorses, some of them just can't cope at all because it's the one climate where they really can't manage. Whereas very cold weather and so on and very wet weather they can cope with as long as they have access to shelter. Free living horses don't tend to live as long as domestic horses. So <clears throat> in the wild, a horse basically lives as long as his teeth. Once his teeth are gone, that's the end of him. Whereas in the domestic situation, that's very different, which I'll mention in a minute. Therefore, free living horses have a low energy diet for much of the year. At the same time, they're constantly moving, coping with a range of temperatures. They're on the alert. They're reproducing, which uses up huge amounts of energy. And also they're not wormed, rugged, have dentistry or hoof care from humans. So all these things are happening. These ponies here in this picture are dark, wild ponies in Dartmoor and they're just in fabulous condition. So they are grazing obviously 24 seven. That's the middle of summer and they're in perfect condition because they're living in the environment that they evolved in. Oh, I don't know what that is. So, Domestic equines, though, are managed by humans for better or for worse, and they have different stresses to their more natural living counterparts. So many don't receive adequate hoof or dental care because we, they need this intervention because they're not living well. So they're not eating the same plants and they're not moving over the same terrain to wear their hooves down. So they do need that intervention. They need that to happen, but it, they don't always get it um, enough or correctly. Um, and most domestic horses are not using energy for reproduction, which is a good thing, obviously, because there's actually, believe it or not, way too many horses in the world already anyway. Um, so the, uh, but the trouble is we're often feeding them at a level where, as if they are reproducing, you know, so, and they just do not need that level of feed. They often receive too little exercise and too much high energy feed rather than lots of low energy, high fiber feed. may be overconfined, and instead of having to find their own feed and water it's literally given to them on a plate so basically we take it to them they're often prevented from interacting with other horses and as i've already mentioned that means that they then develop stereotypic behaviors not seen in natural living horses so there's no cases ever been documented of horses that live in the wild, carrying out, doing things like crib biting, weaving and so on, because there's no need to, there's no, no need to do that. In the domestic situations, well, interestingly, we actually see more aggression than what's seen in free living horses for a couple of reasons. One, separating horses when they're young, as oft horses often are, means that they don't le learn the correct social skills. So basically they don't have the right, they don't learn the right behaviors because horses teach each other those correct behaviors. So we must be careful when introducing them to a herd. But also in the domestic situation, feeding times creates competition. If you think about it in the wild, nobody walks into a bunch of horses with a, with a few buckets of the equivalent of chocolate for them to fight over. Um, that just doesn't happen. Food is either everywhere or nowhere at the same time. And with horses, it's very rare that there's nothing to eat because horses can, if the grass runs out, then they will switch to eating. As I said earlier, they will, if they have to, they'll switch to eating leaves and twigs and anything fibrous just to keep that fiber going through their system. So it's a very rare situation for a horse in the wild to not actually have access to food. When we keep them in the domestic situation, that's very different because we dictate 
how much food they have access to. And this can create more aggression, as I said, because they're either getting fed or they're hungry a lot of the time. So it creates, it creates a lot of anxiety. <clears throat> Just uh, by the way, the horse, domestic horses do tend to live a lot longer than free living horses. The horse here in this picture, very funny story about him. He actually lived to be 51 years old. One of the whole oldest horses on record. I think the oldest on record is 55. But what's amazing about this chap is that well, there's a few things. He, was, he wasn't a tiny pony, which are usually the ones that lived the longest. He was about 15 too. He was a stallion. And he was handed into a welfare centre at 32 because it was thought they wouldn't live much longer. And he lived another 20 years. So, so horses can, domestic horses can far outlive their teeth. And so, you know, by the, he would have lost his teeth years and years before, but they can be fed on other fees and kept going and so on. So they live a lot, lot longer in the domestic situation than they do in the wild. Generally speaking, domestic horses nowadays tend to look, can easily live to be on usually about 30, 35. Many years ago, horses would die of old age more like 20 because they were working much harder. Plus, people didn't tend to keep them alive once they were not useful anymore. They tend to be put down. But now horses are living much, much longer. So that's something to keep in mind as well. If you retire a horse at 20, that horse might go on and live another 20 years. So you need to plan for that as well. And really what we need to be doing is keeping them going as long as possible. Because once you, they stop moving, just like with us, the prob that's when the real problems start. That's when they become harder to manage um, in terms of managing their weight and so on. And they become much less healthy. So as I said earlier, horses used to be work animals, but now we do all the running around and physical hard work. So we're the ones who go out and get the second job or third job even while they stand and watch us while we get on with all the, the actual physical work. Um, <clears throat> and that has, that has happened very recently in, you know, in evolutionary terms. But now getting into the actual behaviours of horses, what, what is really interesting is that understanding the way their mind thinks is that as soon as we start to supplement feed horses, which of course... In the domestic situation, we have to. There's always going to be a time, even if you say, oh, no, my horses are never going to get supplementary fed, whatever, that's just not going to happen in the domestic situation because there's always going to be a time when you run out of feed or uh, whatever, and you're going to have to supplementary feed them. And as soon as you do that, their behavior changes. It changes from looking for their own feed, as they would in the wild, to looking to where the feed comes from, looking out for more feed coming. So what I mean then is they will then start to hang around the gate more if that's where, obviously, that's where you tend to come through with the feed to either bring the food to them and put it in the paddock or collect them and take them to where food is given to them. So they will start to increase that standing around behavior. And again, we need to understand this. We can manage that, but we need to understand it and understand why it happens and it starts to make it easy to manage them. So we get lots of this kind of behavior in here. We've actually got three separated horses. So they're standing at that gateway for another reason as well. They're standing there because that's the only place where all three of them can spend time together. Plus, that's where if they stand there, that's where they're more likely to get supplementary fed. So that's adding to that behavior as well. So just look at that picture and notice all the land degradation that's going on that is pure, caused 100% by that behavior. So again, once you understand that, so for instance, if these horses were kept together for a start off when they're grazing, they, they, you know, they, they would spend more time going off together and grazing rather than standing there like that, then straight away you would be starting to reduce some of those land management issues by keeping them together. And yes, people say, well, no, it's too dangerous to keep the horses together. And somebody really needs to do, come up with some statistics for this, but... Horses, and, and again, this is just me as a generalization, but um, I've owned a lot of horses in my lifetime and I've known a lot of horses. And I would always say, and I've heard, I've heard other people say the same, horses are far more likely to be injured by fences and gates and so on than they are by other horses. But for some reason, we always remember the ones, the, the cases when horses injured each other, but we tend to forget 
the injuries caused by fences. And they're caused because horses are hanging around fences or worse still gateways. So if you think about it, you're bound to know horses who've had sometimes even fatal injuries caused by fences or putting a leg through a gate, going through a fence, that sort of thing. And the reason they do that is because they're separated. So if we can, we can, we can avoid that happening, then we can actually make it safer for them and make it much easier to manage the land. So, as I said, hanging around the gateway seem to be fed or taken to feed creates pressure on the land around the gateway or fence, and this causes erosion, dust, and or mud, because dust and mud are the same things at either end of the spectrum. But when we understand this behaviour, we can actually use it to our advantage, which I'll go into later on. Horses also have something that's peculiar to them in terms of paddock behaviour, and it's actually a natural behaviour, <clears throat> but it's more pronounced in the domestic situation, and that's their dunging behaviour patterns. So horses dung in some areas of the paddock and graze in others. So this means that you end up with this um, mismatched area of land where you've got overgrazed short grass and long rank areas that the horses won't graze. And what that actually means is that over time, you might think you've got, say, five acres of grazing, but you can lose sometimes as much as 60% of that from this behaviour if you don't manage it. And I'm not going into... I can't go into how we do manage that in this talk because it's too short. But um, if you've got the course or whatever, you'll learn all about that. Um, so we end up with these short monocultures of, of grasses, usually cooch grass or whatever. Any A grass that can cope with that really short grazing by being overgrazed, which you don't want your grasses to be just that monoculture of grass. And the other areas where the horses never graze at all. So this leads to an imbalance of nutrients, which increases over time. And as I said, we end up with less and less grazing each year. And this sort of paddock is termed horse sick. It doesn't actually mean the paddock's got a sickness, although, yes, on the other hand, it's not very healthy. Um, it's just a term for a paddock that looks like that. And you won't see this with cattle and sheep. They tend to drop their dung at random around the paddock. Horses drop it in certain areas. And those areas get larger over time, but they always tend to walk to one of those areas to drop their dung. Um, and it's never really been fully understood why they do that. I have my own theories, and I think it's because in the wild they live in a home range rather than migrate. But, um, but anyway, this is what they do, and we do need to manage that behaviour. So um, fence walking, this is a very typical paddock, this paddock here, where the owner might turn the horse out for the day. It's typical of what you'll see on an adjustment centre. The owner turns the horse out for the day thinking the horse is going to get exercise and have a nice time for the day. But all that actually happens is that the horse is going to walk up and down the fence, as you can see there on the right-hand side by the fence. It's all worn out. And then you might be able to see uh, the gate is in the left-hand corner. That's all worn out as well. The horse is going to be interacting with the other horse over the fence, so that's dangerous as well. And as you can see in there, there's virtually no decent grazing to be had at all anyway. So that area of land is getting hammered, and it's not doing the horse any good anyway. It's not safe for the horse. The horse is not getting quality grazing time and so on. So really, it's just a waste of space, and we can turn that around with good management. As I said earlier, fence walking causes all sorts of issues. So this is interesting in this picture here, how you've got a fence that would have literally cost, you know, this whole property, their fencing budget would be hundreds of thousands probably. And yet look at the land, it's, it's weeds, it's, it's, um, it's got that big tracking line down the side of the fence. Eventually, and in certain conditions, that fence would actually end up falling over because the horse would dig such a deep channel walking up and down the fence that they would, um, they would actually make it so that they undermine the fence, the, the, the bottom of the fence. And this behaviour, where they're walking up and down the fence, is exactly the same behaviour that you see in caged animals in zoos. So where you see animals walking backwards and forwards, pacing backwards and forwards, it's exactly the same behaviour for the same reasons. It's because they're not being allowed to carry out their natural and normal behaviours. We're preventing them to, from doing that. And this is so this is their response. So we do need to keep in mind that horses have certain grazing characteristics which makes can make them harder to manage in the domestic situation. But again, 
only if we don't understand what's going on. So horses are able to eat down right down to the ground due to having two sets of incisors. So unlike a, a ruminant animal that only has one set of incisors and uses their tongue to collect the grass, horses have what's almost like a pair of scissors in the mouth and can literally eat grass that's, that's only a few millimetres long. So, um, and this means if you leave them on the same area, day after day, week after week, that they will eventually eat the grass out completely. So, so where you see this horse grazing here, the next stage is that they will just pull that bit of plant out, and even eat the roots of the plant as well. But that's not the horse's fault. That's because they're being put back on the same area of land or left out on the same area of land way after when they should have been removed onto another area. So it's not, it's not that horses are bad for the land, it's that they're managed badly. That's what we need to change. So horses also have mobile lips, which allow them to be very selective. And also the horse is said, by, usually by farmers, to have, have five sets of teeth. And by that we mean the hooves do just as much damage as the mouth. So all that standing around on those hard hooves, especially if they're shod, is even worse, is wearing the land out. It's compacting the soil and so on, um, because that sheer weight of the animal on bare ground may, means that the land becomes compacted much more quickly. So the, the plants are like a cushion, they're like a carpet between the heavy horse and the soil. Once they've gone, the horse is standing on the bare soil and compacting it rapidly at that stage. So we should never be overgrazing our land. So horses are actually highly efficient grazing animals. <clears throat> Again, farmers often think horses are a bit rubbish as grazers, but they're actually fabulous. They're brilliant. They're brilliant at what they do and what they've evolved to do. But in the domestic situation, we have to acknowledge what they need and manage them properly. Um, and therefore, there has to be a compromise. And the reason there has to be a compromise is in the wild, they would have access to, hundreds, as I said, hundreds of square miles or even thousands of square miles. They didn't evolve to be kept on five acres or 10 acres or 20 or even 100 acres. It's still a tiny amount of land. So the compromise actually has to, the compromise cannot be to the environment because remember what I was talking about at the beginning where we have to have, um, we have to have um, sustainability. Otherwise, over time, it's just not going to work. Sooner or later, something's going to break down. So if we over, deliberately overgraze our land, or even not necessarily deliberately, but just let the horses overgraze it, eventually every mouthful of feed your horses eat will have to be bought and paid for. It means you'll have to work harder and you're paying a mortgage or rent on this land, which is actually not doing uh, you or them any good. So it's not sustainable. But if we turn that around, so that the horses um, are getting quality grazing, then that's completely different. But there has to be a compromise. Now, make, reaching that compromise is easy enough once you understand how to do that. And again, I'll be talking about that a little bit later on in this talk. So don't worry, we'll get onto that. So just as an example of how horses can be good for the land, when I, after we'd been in Australia for about 20 years at the point where we started coming back to the UK initially, we were going backwards and forwards. So in the 20 years we'd been away, we were absolutely flabbergasted to learn that horses had gone from being the enemy almost for land management to now being used for what's called conservation grazing projects all over Europe and, and other countries as well. But uh, uh, we, we just saw it in the UK at that time. So this project here was one of the first, um, an area called Wiccan Fen in Norfolk, where the land had been, after the war, it had all been, you'd got all these ancient grasslands, which after the war were just ploughed up and turned into, for cropping to feed the nation after the war. So all these important grasslands had just been ripped up. And it's then, then it was realised that, you know, we've got a huge problem with the lack of biodiversity. So the National Trust actually started this project about 15 years ago, I think it was, where they brought in uh, these semi-feral ponies. And so they've got a herd of semi-feral ponies and a herd of semi-feral cattle. And they didn't even replow and reseed the land. They just allowed them to get on with these, this large area and graze it. And that land has turned from 100% ryegrass into highly biodiverse wetland. 
And because of what they've created, there now is bird life there that hasn't been seen in the area for you know a long time before that and so on. And this is now happening, it's more often called rewilding now all over Europe, where they're using a combination of cattle and horses because the two together create the right, if, if it's meant to be a grazed area, create the right conditions then for biodiversity and then for other wildlife to come in. So the two together complement each other. And we just did a talk last week at a very important rewilding project called NEP Castle down, in, um, down near Brighton in the UK. And again, they've gone from being an unproductive farm making a loss every year to being a productive farm selling um, organic beef, using ponies and cattle grazing alongside each other to rewild the land. They have hardly any input. They, you know, they no longer spend money on fertilizers, machinery, all these things that they used to have to do before because they're just letting the animals rewild the land. So there's lots of this happening. Um, but the, the upshot is that horses actually can be really good for their land and are, are recognised as such. And what's interesting here in this group is that there's about 50 horses. There's actually three groups living together with their own stallion and her, her, harem of mares. But at certain times of the day, they all come together quite amicably. And then certain times they move apart. So in these pictures here, you can see some of the, um, the interaction taking place, a lot of clay behaviour and so on. But they all get on really well because that's that you know they live together all the time. And if you think about domestic horses, how they just tend to stand around looking a bit listless or whatever, it's very different. There's a lot of interaction going on with these horses. So if you ever get over to the UK, get in touch and I can point you in the right directions for some really interesting projects to go and have a look at. There's a lot of really interesting stuff to see. This is one of them. So why is land management so important for your horses? By creating a healthy grazing environment, you can create healthy, happy horses. And at the same time, obviously, if you aim to maximize your, your horse, the time your horses spend grazing, so, sorry, by, by managing the land well, that means they can go out for, better, for more quality grazing time rather than being. So it's better, if you like, to turn, even if your horses only got out for four or 10 hours a day, if that's on quality grazing time, rather than turning them out 24 seven on bare land, that is actually better because they're getting to carry out those, those natural behaviors. Whereas when you turn them out on bare soil, they're not getting to carry out those natural behaviors. And this is something, once you get your head fully around that, it can really revolutionize how you manage your land because most of us don't have enough land. So we have to, we, this is what I'm talking about, where the compromise has to come in. We have to manage it so that the time they do spend grazing is quality grazing time. And then they're benefiting themselves, the environment, saving you money, um, and all sorts of things. There's lots of benefits from that. So <clears throat> a lot of people are trying out different ways of managing their horses and the weight. And a lot of them are based on some form of restrictive or feeding grazing practice. So typically in Australia, you know, people have like a Jenny Craig paddock. We um, really don't like that concept because it's it's literally wrecking the land deliberately for the sake of the horses. It's not sustainable. So if you have horses who cannot graze for some reason, they should be on a surface area, not on soil, making it even degrading that soil because especially in Australia, the, the soil sometimes is only you know a couple of inches deep and it's gone. If you overgraze it, then you get a drought followed by heavy rain, and then every bit of that soil disappears um, off your land. If you if you've got a lucky neighbour, they might inherit all that soil, or more often than not, what actually ends up happening is that soil ends up in the waterways, ends up in the sea where it's not meant to be, and you've lost your topsoil. So. Hopefully after this talk, you'll start to think about bare soil even more. So it always should have some kind of cover on it. It should be mulched, which we have a really good video on mulching on our website. So that's covering it up with some kind of organic matter to break down and grow grass again. Um, or it should have a permanent surface on it if that's where the horses spend a lot of time. We shouldn't have horses standing around on bare soil creating mud and dust because it means that you're, that you're losing your soil. So poor management stresses the grass. It, mean, it means that the grass that they are eating 
is short stress grass, which per mouthful is really high in sugar. Um, and it, and it, you know, it's not good for the horse's metabolic system. Healthy pasture and healthy soil work together and you can't have one without the other. When you have longer grasses, that means that below the ground, you've got longer roots. So the longer the grass plant, the longer the roots. And all the more, also the more carbon sequestration is going on. You can't see that happening, but that's what's happening. Good grass, good pasture is actually even more efficient at getting carbon out of the air and into the soil than trees are. Trees are very good, but they take a long time to do it. Pasture, by being growing tall and being grazed and growing again, that action of grazing, that, that complete, you're constantly re re replenishing it, is pumping carbon down into the soil. So this is one of the reasons why grazing animals are so important for, climate, for global warming, climate change and so on. If we can get more biodiverse grasslands happening and more large grazing herbivores grazing them, that gets a lot of carbon down into the soil. So basically what happens is the animals come along, graze that area, graze it down, the roots die back, so they shorten, and then they grow, and then as the plant grows, they grow again. So they're constantly putting more carbon down into the soil. So this is one of the reasons why horses and, and other large grazing herbivores are so important. All grazing animals are, kangaroos and so on as well. So we need to understand about how long horses spend doing the different things they do. So grazing in horses, it's often said that horses graze for about 20 hours a day. Well, that's actually not true because there isn't, literally isn't enough hours in a day. Horses need certain amount of time for the other behaviours as well, which I'll go into briefly in a minute. Horses generally graze for around 12 to 15 hours a day. So your domestic horse is programmed, if you like, to graze for that amount of time. Um, they can extend their grazing up to 18 to 20 hours, but that would be in really extreme conditions. So say horses starving, living out in the outback or whatever, and at that point, they wouldn't actually be grazing. They'd just be looking for food. They'd be walking around eating every, every bit of fibre they could get their teeth on. But if they have access to grazing, to actual grasses, they will knock off after about 15 hours in the day. And this is because they need time to do the other behaviours as well. But that is still a long time spent grazing. <clears throat> so grazing is the most natural way for your horse to feed itself and millions of years of evolution have created this, this harmonious symbi symbiotic relationship between grazing animals and plants. So they both help each other. So for instance, if plants aren't grazed back, they don't get to regrow and set seed again. So grazing actually helps the plants in that respect, but they shouldn't be overgrazed. They need to be grazed the right amount, but then uh, left to rest and recuperate. That's where rotational grazing comes in. So as I said, horses spend a minimum of 12 hours a day grazing, um, but up to a maximum of 20 when conditions are very scarce. When horses graze, in scientific terms, they graze in what's called bouts. A grazing bout tends to last between one and a half and three hours. So that means if you turn your horse out onto decent pasture, they'll start grazing but they'll stop when the grazing bout ends, they'll stop when the, con when the fiber content in the stomach indicates that the stomach, when they've eaten enough. The interesting thing about that point is that if your horse is only eating sugary, high energy feed, but that's very low in fiber, the horse doesn't get that message that it's full enough and doesn't stop eating. So that's an added danger when horses are grazing, say short grass that's very sugary, they don't get that message to tell them they've eaten enough fiber because they haven't eaten enough fiber yet. So they just keep going, keep eating. And that's one of, again, what makes it so dangerous when they're on that type of feed. Whereas when they have high fiber food, they will get that message that they've eaten enough fiber and stop eating. And that happens typically around one and a half to three hours. It all depends on how high fiber the feed is. So fiber is often sought over nutritional value because it's fiber that keeps horses' digestive system working. So given the choice, horses will choose fiber. And again, going back to that point where I said, if you're turning horses out on fresh green grass, always give them access to fiber. You'll usually find that they'll voluntarily bring themselves off that fresh grass 
just to eat some dry fiber because they desperately need that going into their digestive system. Now, this is a really important point, this one. So hopefully you get this one because it really can turn things around if you understand this one fully. Grazing is linked to walking. The horse's whole physiology has evolved to enable this to happen efficiently. efficiently. And what this means is if you turn a horse out on a bare paddock, which is often happens, especially in Australia, because you know there's droughts and so on, the ho yes, the horse might run around for five minutes or 10 minutes because he's, say, being in a stable or a yard overnight. You might bum around and the owner thinks, oh, yeah, he's, he's getting lots of exercise. But the minute he's run that excess energy off, which doesn't take very long, if there's no grass to eat, the horse will immediately switch to just standing around because horses you know, don't see any point in expending energy for the sake of it. They don't say to themselves, well, I've got a competition on the weekend, so I need to keep fit. So even though there's no grass to eat, I'll keep walking because I need to keep fit. If, they, if they're walking down the fence, that's a stereotypic behavior. That's for a different reason. That's because they're stressed. But they don't exercise themselves in the paddock just for the fun of, just for the fun of it. Once that excess energy has been burned off, they'll switch from running around like a mad thing to standing completely still. What keeps horses moving is grazing because the grass doesn't come to them. As I said, they're quite happy it would came on a conveyor belt, but it doesn't. They have to go to the grass. So they, set, they walk around the paddock looking for plants to nibble. And the more biodiverse the pasture, the more they move. So that's a really interesting point as well. If you can get a variety of grasses in your pasture, the horses will just keep walking around looking for those different plants. Think about if you have, if you do practice rotational grazing, which you should do, which is where you're taking horses off land when he's had enough and then putting them back on when he's had a chance to rest and recuperate. If you watch them in those first few hours you turn them out, they will be moving constantly looking for those different plants. If you turn them out on a paddock that says 100% one plant, they'll quickly work out that there's only one type of plant in there and they won't move much at all. It's that biodiversity that keeps them moving. So there's these are different ways that we can get them to carry out their exercise to carry out exercise. So what's interesting is if horses walk at one kilometer an hour when grazing, because they're just walking steadily and they graze for 12 hours, they'll have walked a minimum of 12 kilometers that day of slow, steady exercise. And that's the sort of exercise along with the occasional bum around that, that horses need. That's, that's, that's what they need to keep them healthy, that slow, steady movement, which is pumping, um, the, you know, is get, keeping the lymphatic system going, circulatory system and so on. That slow, steady movement, that's exactly what it's doing. Jane, just excuse me. Yeah, we're um, an hour in. So uh, how much more have you got there? And uh, uh, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I can have a quick look. Um, let me see. I'll end the show and have a look. Didn't realise it was going so slow. Uh, trying to get... Oh, I'll stop share. Right, so I'm on 64 out of 95, so I'm pretty much only two-thirds of the way through. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So. No problem. We'll just, um, we'll just uh, let people know that, that's, uh, that we've got <laughs> still a little bit to go. Um, if if you're happy it. to stay, we'll keep recording. Um, otherwise... Uh, we will have this recording available anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll speed it up now. Uh, right. Ooh. 
So grazing is the activity that takes up most of their time or should be, and it's often given little thought other than worrying about weight gain. But there's strong evidence to suggest that over time, by increasing the health of your soil and the grasses, most horses can and will learn to self-regulate and be returned to healthier pasture. But again, I'm not going to go into that too much here. So um, sleeping about four hours a day. Um, and that, that's different positions, standing up, laying down and so on. But they need around four hours a day. So they don't actually sleep very long compared to other animals. Um, they sleep or snooze in three different positions. <clears throat> and it tends to be in 15-minute bouts. Um, low thing is everything else horses do with their day. So that's standing around together. Um, flicking flies off each other's face, that sort of thing. That's called loafing and playing, obviously, very important loafing behaviour. And as much as possible, we want to get that loafing behaviour to take place off the land because that is what actually creates a lot of land degradation, that just standing around on the land. And again, we go into how you can do that. As I said, that includes lots of different behaviours. So carry, encourage them to carry that out off the land. <clears throat> We need to be, um, a, a good way of um, thinking about what horses really need is what's known as the three Fs. So that's friendship. And that everybody knows that horses need to live in a group, but they need, they need interaction with other horses for skin care, support, stimulation, and so on. They need uh, forage, so they need a high fiber diet. So remember a horse is basically a fiber processing animal. And they need freedom. They need food, freedom to move, but they also need freedom to choose. If you think about how horses live, we put in the domestic situation, we pretty much dictate every step they take, especially with a stabled horse. But even with a, a paddock kept horse, we dictate when he goes out, when he comes in, and so on. Whereas if we can turn that around, which we can show you how to do, we can actually make it so they get to be their own choices about when to come in, when to go out. And that makes a huge difference for horses, just having that choice. So is there a way to combine all of these factors into an easy management system, which will reduce the workload and, is, and be good for the environment? Well, it turns out there is. What we can do in the domestic situation is create a mini home range for our horses where we provide a hard standing area and we allow the horses to bring themselves to that and take themselves out as and when. So it often means changing things a little bit. But again, this is what, um, you know, it's not too hard to do once you know how. But basically what we're doing then is allowing the horses to have choice. Um, where, and it vastly reduces that grazing pressure. They're no longer standing around in the gateway. Look, if you look at this picture here, you can see how the gateway is not worn out because the horses are never actually fastened in the paddock, they're allowed to come back to the hard standing. I'll, oh, so I'll just go on to this picture. Basically, this is where you might use an arena or a surface yard or whatever. By the way, we've got less slides than I thought we had. Um, we're not too far off the end now. You've got uh, an area of hard standing and the horses take themselves out for a grazing bout, bring themselves back into where the feed and water is, spend time standing around loafing and so on, and then take themselves back out for another grazing bow. And what that means is that they're never standing in a paddock at the gate waiting to be let back in. And this is what we call the equicentral system, which is what we developed in Australia, and we now teach all around the world. And people have had huge benefits from doing this. The paddocks are rotationally grazed, so only one paddock is in use at any one time. This means then that you've got safer grasses, the horses get to move more because every time they want a drink, they've got to come back in. That means, well, I'll just go through some of the advantages. There's some of them there. The horses have to move in and out. You don't have to trail around feeding them. The um, Any hay is fed in the yard rather than out in the paddock. Less manure is dropped in the paddock. So if you want to collect your manure, it's in the yard. The horses have to move more and so on. There's lots of advantages. And it vastly reduces the grazing pressure on the land without stressing the horses at all, because they can now make their own decisions about where they want to be and when, which to me as a behaviorist is what is a really, really big deal. Um, but yeah, just all that not standing around makes a massive difference to your land management. Right, so, so, uh, so I went through that pretty quickly there. So we're on to um, the slide that you wanted, Viviana, if you want to talk about that one. 
Um, and then I'm quite happy to answer questions afterwards about the ecocentral system and so on. More information. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that, Jane. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, yes. Lovely. Okay. Um, yeah, look, I just um, would like to really um, second uh, everything um, Jane has um, spoken about uh, today um, in terms of keeping your ground cover. Ground cover is key. That's key to reducing soil erosion. And um, it, it's an asset on your property and it assists with um, conserving water and, and conserving resources. Now, there are um, a lot of, there, there's a lot of local knowledge about and assistance available to, to landholders through your local councils and local land care groups um, and for Melbourne Water as well. So I've just listed them and the next page too, please, Jane. Yeah, just click on the next yep. to them. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, as well as um, Melbourne Water. So we have, um, Melbourne Water have incentive programs and, and so do many of the local councils, um, but just assistance with, with weed ID and with um, farm planning as well. So I really encourage you to check out the local um, council's website. The other thing um, I'd really encourage you to do is have a look at um, participating in the full aquaculture course. So um, all the um, partnering uh, councils, which are Masson Ranger Shire, Wyndham City Council, the City of Whittlesea, City of Hume and Mitchell Shire Council have partnered together with Melbourne Water to subsidise, and that it's a significant subsidy, the full aquaculture course. Um, that's available. So it's normally $125 and that's at a discounted price. But with these subsidies from Melbourne Water and your local council, the landholder only pays um, $25 and the rest is subsidised. So I might just get you quickly, Jane, just to um, quickly cover what the aquaculture course um, um, entails in, in a few minutes yeah. and then we can yeah, wrap it up. So there. Thank you. So, yeah, so the, the course goes into a lot of detail about some of the things I've just skimmed on here. Um, it includes the books as well as PDFs, um, which have been sold now for quite a few years. Um, and yeah, people just love them. Um, so the, the course has got videos, uh, the books, articles, lots of resources, lots of links to all sorts of um, things you need to know about, like dung beetles, uh, mulching, lots of different things like that. But one of the best things about the course as well is there's a private Facebook group that you can join once you have the course. And that's just fantastic because over the years, we've had so many people for so many years now following this our system of management that our, our background is, is actually equine behaviour and grazing behaviour in particular. But we've got other people who've joined us who are, say, um, you know, all sorts of different, there are soil scientists and all sorts of plant specialists and so on. So when you're in the group, you get the benefit of all their knowledge as well. So it's an absolutely amazing group. Um, and you get to join that when you when you've done the when you've got the course. The course, once you sign up for it, is is lifelong. You know, there's no rush to do it or whatever. And we're starting to do a lot more webinars and things. And so if you have the course, you can join in those for free. Um, I know you can this one anyway, but what I mean is the other ones that we're doing, like I'm doing one on the 19th of October about grazing behaviour. We're going to grazing behaviour in a lot more detail. Um, and you can join in all those for free when you're on the course. Our aim is just to get as many people as possible doing this. There's already thousands of people in Australia keeping the horses in this way. Um, but basically, we need all horse owners to be thinking about managing their land more sustainably. Um, Horse owner, what's really interesting is horse owners are the custodians of all these small, relatively small bits of land, but joined together, that they can have a huge effect um, on um, climate change and so on, because we can be creating land for wildlife, we can be sequestering carbon, we can be doing all these really important jobs by just doing it on our own 5, 10 or 20 acres of land or whatever. If we know how to do that, then we're actually doing a, something really positive for climate change and for the environment, obviously, in general. So, But we need to understand how to do that. And it's not hard when you know how, 
but we need to be doing it and we can do that. So that's our aim is to try and get that happening as much as possible. Sorry, I've shut up now. <laughs> we'll um, go to a few questions that, uh, and I apologise, um, there's been lots of chat um, and everyone helping one another, which is terrific. Uh, so I've got to just go back uh, to some of the first questions uh, from Madeline. Uh, I have a 35 year old rescue horse with bad teeth. The vet has uh, said that the old horse his ability to digest and extract nutrient is re reduced. Feeding hay is not recommended in his old, um, as his teeth don't chew properly. Uh, I have lots of good grass, including clover, but I feed him twice a day and oat and loosen chaff with soaked gum nuts and microbeak. Do you have any thoughts on this feeding for this old horse or do we need to change that? So if, they are, if you're already feeding him on chaff because his teeth are diminished and so on, there's not really much more you can do. There's lots of senior feeds for senior horses, but all we have to keep remembering is in the wild, I mean, I don't mean this in a negative way, in the wild he wouldn't be alive by now. He would have died out when his teeth went. So it stands to reason in the domestic situation we have to intervene in that situation. So there is lots of feeds around for older horses. Um, and really, that's all you can do, because without teeth, he can't graze properly, um, especially once the front teeth have gone. Even once the back teeth have gone, he can't, because they need both sets to graze properly anyway. So if, I'm, I'm, I hope, hopefully I did get your question properly. But if, yeah, if you're feeding him on chaff and so on, then you're already doing the right thing. Um, but at least if he does get to spend time out with other horses while they're grazing, even though he can't graze properly, at least he's benefiting from the movement that goes with being with the other horses. So if you can, try and still make it so that he does get, as long as they're not bullying him, try and make it so that he still does get to go out with the other horses. Uh, the next one, uh, Jane, was if they don't have a, another equine com companion, is other grazing animals such as sheep and cattle um, a compromise really good question that one and we've actually got an article on that on the website but yes it is a good question yes and no so it's not ideal but it's definitely better to have another grazing companion companion than nothing but i, I sometimes use an example of a of where we used to live in queensland there used to be on the a few doors down there was a horse and a cow that lived in the same paddock together and it was quite funny really well it was funny but sad but funny as well they would because their behaviors are different to each other they used to do you'd see them where the cow would be laid down because cows lay down sometimes eight hours a day and the horse would be doing his you know diligent horse thing and standing over him but as soon as the cow had finished laying down he'd just get up and walk off but would never stand over the horse when he laid down because cows don't do that. They don't have that behavior. So with cows, with their young, they just park them in the grass and go off and graze where horses stand over each other when, they, when they're sleeping. But what was funny sort of was that they used to, they used to mutually groom each other. The cow didn't want to, but the horse used to force the cow to mutually groom with him. So this, it was a really good example of how they were coping and they and you know they were stuck to each other like glue because that's all they had. So it was definitely better than nothing, but their behaviors didn't complement each other either, you know, in, in many ways. They'd sort of learned to cope, but it's not ideal. But yes, if you can't have another horse, definitely another animal is better than nothing. But really, um, another horse is best because they have the right behaviors. Um, to be able to, you know, carry out those important behaviours. So, yeah, but it's not, you know, there's nothing ideal in this world. Just do what you can. And um, and if, if you can't have another horse, then have another animal. Be careful with sheep and goats because the horses can be a bit rough with them. But if it's their only companion, they'll tend to look after them a bit better than if they say a group of young horses have access to, say, sheep, they can use them like footballs and pick them up and throw them and things like that. So just be aware of that as well when you're crossing with other species. Another question I have here is, uh, what advice do you have about pasture species that should be planted for horses? 
Well, basically, I, like, I can only talk really generally there because obviously Australia is, even Australia is different to the UK and so on. But even in Australia, you've got massive differences between North and South. But generally speaking, you're looking at the, the types of grasses that often a farmer would regard as weeds. And by that, what I mean is not actually necessarily directly weeds, but farmers would call them weeds simply because they're too low in sugar. So if a farmer thinks it's a good grass, it tends to be, say, a, certainly down in Victoria, that would be a rye grass, which would be too high in sugar for horses. What you want for the horses, best of all, is native Australian pasture. I mean, that is absolutely amazing if, you, if you've got that. Australian native grasses are fantastic for horses, even though they haven't evolved alongside each other. They are wonderful. Um, but if you don't have that, then you need to be looking at um, pasture mixes of what we would call older fashion type grasses. So grasses that, again, as I said, farmers are not as interested in because they're not high enough in sugar. For horses, they're generally very good because they're the grasses that are lower in sugar, higher in fiber per mouthful, and that's what you really want. But a good thing, there's always lots of, we used to find this in Australia, there's always lots of help out there where you can ask these sort of questions of local. If you just go to, to a seed, plant uh, so, so um, a shop that sells grass seeds they will tend to just have an ag agronomy background and tend to sell you those ryegrass seeds but if you go to say a land care group they will tell you what will and can grow in your area and you'll tend to get better advice that way so i'll um thanks very much jane i will now um stop the recording uh, yeah. and thank everyone for their attendance and hope you've enjoyed this event. Good.